Husband to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope. Using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've got an important topic for people today because as a bereaved parent, I can tell you that one of the major things that I was always worried about was how were the kids doing and how was a family going to uh, deal with a tragedy, a sudden loss of uh, having your brother killed in an automobile accident very quickly. So those traumatic losses. So Heidi, we've got some really great experts on the show today who's going to help folks out there that I know are feeling what are they going to do? What are their kids going to do? What are families going to do? So would you like to introduce our guests? I would love to. And we're going to talk about an amazing organization today called Co. So like you said, mom, we're going to be talking about supporting children who have experienced grief and trauma. Adam Robinovich is the executive director of the Co Foundation. He's also a brief sibling and his sister died when she was under two years old. Um, the Cope Foundation is a nonprofit grief and healing organization dedicated to helping parents and families living with the loss of a child. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you for having me and having Claire Sharkey, our clinical director, join as well. It's great to have you. And as you said, Claire is joining you also. She is actually one of my former students at Columbia University. So I love having her on the show. She also crewed our Open to Hope cable show for years. Yes. So we know Claire well. She is a licensed clinical social worker. She recently joined the Cope Foundation in the role of clinical director, as Adam has said. And she is going to develop and oversee clinical programming. And she is also building her private practice. Um, she also is coming from a place where she understands grief on a personal level because she lost her father a few years ago. Adam lost his sister, Marnette, when yeah. she was very young. What, Adam, was it two or something? Not even, yeah. Uh, we lost, uh, my parents have been living with the loss of uh, Marnette. Thank you for bringing her up. Um, I was born uh, in 1973, not the U.S., and she came along a few years later. Um, and uh, since Marnette uh, passed, we have lived with her loss without uh, really talking too much about her And in, in the last few years since I've been uh, the executive director of COPE and involved in the work of supporting other families in the club that no one wants to belong to. It's given my parents and me and my brother and sister a chance to talk about Marnit in, in a new way. So uh, I've learned that there was nothing like COPE or Open to Hope for my family back then. So it's great that there's organizations here today uh, to meet the needs of so many families across the country. I love hearing this, Adam, because my mother and I are always saying it's never too late to start talking about these kind of losses. And I love that you're, you're talking about it with your family now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I was curious, how old were you? I was uh, four going on five. I have uh, some uh, vivid, um, vague memories, if that's such a thing, of playing peekaboo with her. Wow. And, uh, and certainly some, some family photos, which have been um, shared. And I don't want to overstate uh, the extent to which we've um, uh, recognized over the last few years uh, as a family, but we've certainly had some new, new to us conversations uh, and the work that I've been doing and, and Claire and others have been helping in the background just to support me as well as a, as a bereaved sibling uh, living with the loss for 40 plus years of my sister. Mm -hmm. and, and Claire, you know, you were saying that your dad uh, died when you were an adult and what age were you? About 28. So let's talk a little bit about kids and loss and families. But what do kids and families need after a, a significant loss? Whenever I'm talking with caregivers and parents about supporting children, I always want them to start with themselves too, because it's that thing that they say in an airplane, you know, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. We are the model for our kids. They take their cues from us. And so we need to support our own grief and our own individual experience first so that we can show up for our kids and then also that we can reach out for the support to help us in supporting them. And so I always start with the caregivers because I think a lot of times they first, they say things like, like, 
I'm okay if they're okay, or I'm only coming to this group for my kid. And really you have to also be focusing on your own experience. Um, Cope's model of supporting the full family unit that includes fathers, caregivers, who may be men, um, moms, sisters, teens, and, and, and increasingly kids as well, uh, has really been to help have a common language for uh, and common uh, set of tools for a family unit to have in their shared loss. So some of the ways that we've uh, welcomed uh, men in particular, uh, uh, certainly not limited to are some of our uh, frontline staff, including facilitators are men, uh, identify as men, and that's um, created some safe spaces for others. We have um, uh, dads and grandfathers uh, who have been in our programs who then take on a mentor role or a buddy role, a welcoming hand for other, not only men, but certainly a, a, a common ground um, between uh, the, the guys in the, in the club that no one wants to belong to. So more often than not, when we create a space, people will step up and step into it. So Claire, what about blended families? Families come in all shapes and sizes. And when I'm talking with um, families on the phone doing intakes, I'm getting a lot of, say, moms who are divorced from now the deceased dad, and they're trying to figure out a way to support their child. And again, it's about finding ways to show up for them and whether or not it's you. So I worked with a mom once where she was divorced, and it was really hard for her to share happy memories with her child and so she really worked hard to connect with her um, ex-husband's friends to have her child spend time with them and share in the happy memories with them. And that was her way to keep his memory alive, but also be protective of her own grief and her own experience with him. It's about thinking creatively about that it doesn't always come in the way that you think support might be. It might it might be therapy, it might be a group for yourself, but it might be something else that you're that you can reach out to and get support in a different way. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's such a great idea. What I wanted to ask, how old do you think um, kids need to be before they can benefit from grief groups? Well, it's hard for me to reverse engineer to when I was four or five, but I could say um, with lots of confidence that shortly thereafter, had there been a cope or an open to hope um, for my parents and I, and maybe even my brother and sister who came along after and didn't get to to meet Marnit, um, I would have uh, certainly benefited and to have some of the language and tools that we're talking about now and that um, Claire's uh, been focused on throughout her career um, for so many families uh, would have gone a long way in the community that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I have run children's groups and the ones that I've done have typically started at five, but it's really about developmental age. As you mentioned, my father passed away some time ago and I have a three-year-old daughter and she noticed at some point that she only had three grandparents. And so one day she just kind of like asked, well, what happened to your dad? And so I explained very clearly, directly, with developmentally appropriate language um, that he had passed away. She was eating and she just kind of looked at me and said, what happened to your dad? And I said, well, he actually died. Um, she fortunately had seen a Daniel Tiger episode about death and grief. So she had a little bit of a framework about it. And I think that's important for grownups to remember that kids are picking up on cues and information about this, whether we think they're, they are or not. So I knew she had a little bit of knowledge. Um, and so then I've just followed her lead every once in a while. She asks about him. What's his, what was his favorite color? Um, how did that happen? Um, I was talking to Adam about this the other day that she asked me one day out of the blue if he died in the water. And I said, no. Um, and I realized that the reason she asked that was because she was watching Frozen. And if you know Frozen, the Anna and Elsa's parents, their ship sinks. And that's why she was asking that. She was picking that up. And so it was about just following her questions and answering honestly, concisely, not making it scary, just making it honest um, and understandable to her. And she's only three. Mm -hmm. I like this, Claire, giving age appropriate information, because if we don't give children any information, their Im imaginations go to really scary places. Yeah. Like, you know, like you were saying, Claire, and like Adam's pointing out, it's very, we have to be careful what, if what we're telling kids. I mean, if we give the message to kids, hey, you know, your aunt or your grandmother or whoever died peacefully in their sleep, 
Well, if that is comforting to an adult, that can be frightening to children. They can yeah. think, well, well I, if I go to sleep, will I die? Mm-hmm. How do people die while they're sleeping? So being aware of what, the kind of things that we're saying to kids and giving I- them the appropriate freedom. Right, Claire? Yeah, absolutely. We're we are uncomfortable with death because we've been socialized that as adults, but kids only have the context that we give them and we provide them so we can be that example for them and allow them to have the correct words and not really attach necessarily that scariness to it or make it confusing by using niceties um, that can just be, be very unclear for them. I'm curious how you remember your sister being remembered as in retrospect uh there could have been uh, uh, dinner conversations there could have been um uh, uh memory shared uh good bad um sad for sure living with a, a a child who was very ill um and i am fortunate and grateful now that at this chapter in my life and still having my parents with me. And again, my brother and sister who didn't get to know Marnit, that we, uh, it's never too late to have those conversations. So we're we're starting now and um, I'm grateful to cope and and the the field of bereavement care and grief have have opened my eyes and given some some, um, prompts for me to use in in my own family. Uh, And with my daughter as well, she never got to meet uh, her aunt uh, for sure. So um, we're we're, we're paying it forward in, in the Rabinovich family as well. Oh, that's lovely. Well, before we end the show, I want to talk about Cope and Camp Aaron and um, anything you would like to say about it. You're basically in the metropolitan area, right? Yeah, thank you. We we are a, a New York, uh, downstate New York for your listeners and audience who know uh, the geography founded 20 plus years ago. Uh, and increasingly, and certainly during the last year and a half of social distancing and telemental health, and with Claire joining in a leadership position, we've continued to expand the scope and the geography of the families that we're supporting. So 20 plus years ago, uh, the COPE founders came together living with the loss of their uh, then adult children and created a network and built a nonprofit corporation. And we're still here today supporting families across New York and across the country and even internationally. And 10 years ago, we joined the Iluna Network, uh, a a network which uh, your listeners may also be aware of, which hosts uh, a series of bereavement camps for kids aged 7 to 17 called Camp Erin. We are the New York City metro area host of Camp Erin. This will be uh, 10 years at the end of 2021 for us in that work. Uh, we run programs throughout the year. Uh, now, uh, as uh, as of the end of uh, 2021, still primarily uh, online, safely uh, through telemental health, through telehealth, for parents, siblings, teens, and uh, we're going to continue to meet people where they are and do it in a safe way, pandemic notwithstanding. Great. How can we find you? Please, for anyone who wants to reach out, learn more get involved, uh, join our groups, join our programs, support other families uh, who need us. You can connect at copefoundation.org. Again, it's copefoundation.org. Great, thank you. Well, before we end, I wanna get from each of you, if you had one thing to say about supporting children who've experienced grief and trauma, Claire, what would it be? Well, I would actually say that given right now, because of COVID, there's certainly a lot of challenges in finding support for your grief, but there's also a lot of opportunities in terms of telemental health. You don't have to worry about necessarily getting childcare to go to a therapist, or you don't need to worry about driving your child to go to a support group. You can really access resources that might not have been accessible before. And I think it's just a really important time to to think about the other ways that you can get that support. Awesome, thank you. So reach out, Adam. Well, got Claire, said, Claire said it as well as you can, so I'll keep it short. And just to uh, piggyback on what she said is the message is to stay connected to everyone. No one is alone. And uh, whether it's COPE and or Open to Hope or, or whatever local or um, national groups uh, can, can support you, please reach out. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, I love it. Well, thank you guys for being on our show today and for the wonderful work that you both are doing. Thank you, thank Gloria you. and Heidi. Yes, thank you for everything that COPE is doing in Camp Aaron. They're phenomenal. Peer support is invaluable. 
And I love all the work that this organization is doing to bring people hope after loss. So thank you to both of you. Thanks everybody for joining us today. And Heidi and I want to remind you always to visit us at Open to Hope. And if you lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.